friend of the show, DC Bureau Chief of The Intercept, Ryan Grimm. Hello, Ryan. Thanks uh, for taking the time to, to come on the show, and I'm sure you have a million things to do. Oh, always a pleasure. Oh, good. good. Well, um, we, I feel like had, uh, and, and you too, but I feel like we had largely avoided the mandate discourse in, until your article. So I really appreciate you, uh, you bringing the hmm. word mandate back into the conversation. And not the vaccine kind. No, not that kind. Um, but we are talking about genuine medical freedom here, which is abortion. And you wrote a piece uh, up at The Intercept about how uh, you know, exit polls have indicated abortion was the top concern that really put Democrats over the top in, uh, in terms of what, was, what a lot of voters were prioritizing at the ballot box. And we saw Kansas earlier in the year ballot initiative affirming this and then on election day vermont uh kentucky as well michigan as well um the voters making their <laughs> opinions clear about abortion mm -hmm. i mean is, is that Did the you major montana too oh i didn't uh, yeah, yeah montana, montana as well right montana as well um so it's just i mean is that the major takeaway on a national level from the uh from the results of, the, of these midterms it, it, it's the it's the thing that uh, you know changed it from a you know 30 seat pickup which was which is what was being projected by a lot of these uh, prognosticators and and republicans were talking earlier in the year about like a 50 uh, seat pickup i think the a point that uh, that i was making earlier this week and that like aoc actually made last night in an interview with me that this also points to the value and the power of full employment as a as a politics, uh, you know, over and against the focus on inflation is is worth teasing apart. But I think separate from that, if you imagine a world in which the Supreme Court does what the Supreme Court has done for the last 50 years, which is not overturn Roe v. Wade, I think you're probably looking at several dozen uh, seats lost by Democrats uh, mm -hmm. and Republicans picking up and probably picking up uh, some Senate seats, too. Uh, probably Arizona, probably Nevada. Um, and so in that sense, that's the gap. Like that's the mandate The the difference was in, in that ruling and people's mm -hmm. re and people's reaction to it. And so then the, then there's a question of, well, what do you do with it? I mean, I would argue, well, it, it gives, it gives Biden a lot of um, room to run on, you know, what he can do on, you know, federal property when it comes to you know helping with abortion access in states that have that have banned it clearly voters will reward democrats for fighting on this and then as as aoc pointed out in her uh, interview with me last night um there will be if republicans do end up taking over the house and it's hilarious that that it's an if at this mm -hmm. point it's very likely but it's not it's thursday and it's not certain yet right. they will have it by a couple of seats that those will be vulnerable republicans like we're talking about people in new york state who won by you know just a couple of thousand votes and you can hammer them week after week you know will you will you sign on with democrats to codify roe v wade so they they either as, as she put it they either feel so much pain that they let something get through which i don't see kevin mccarthy doing um or or they lose in two years now you could also she floated a discharge petition um, which you could, you know, you, which means that people, you know, indivisible members in, in congressional districts represented by a moderate Republican could constantly ask them to sign this petition that says, I want a house floor vote. And if you get 218 signatures on a discharge petition, the rule is you're supposed to get a house floor vote on the legislation. And then it, then it becomes a Senate fight. So yeah, I think there's a, uh, a big mandate, um, that Democrats could do a lot with creatively. Well, I mean, do you foresee them uh, even approaching this in the lame duck? I know they're going to be dealing with the debt ceiling, and that probably should be priority one, um, just as a way to curb Republican ob yeah. obstruction coming up. But this is more an ability. This is from from your perspective. This is more of a, a political cudgel for Democrats to use for the that very slim margin of vulnerable 
uh, Republicans in blue states where, all, you know, they can they can be pressured and then subsequently beaten based on that. That's that is the minimum that they could do. They could also pass something in the lame duck and then say to Manchin and Cinema, like, come on, like, we got this massive mandate. Let's reform the filibuster for mm. abortion rights. John Fetterman ran on overturning the filibuster and on full suite of abortion rights. He won. He's going to be in Washington in the beginning of January. So you, you tell Manchin and Cinema, just do it right now because we can't do it again. Uh, you know, if Republicans take over the House, we can't do it unless you do a discharge petition, which you, if you could get, let, let's say they let's say they uh, end up with 213 Democrats. They only need five Republicans at that point to say, OK, you know, I'm actually I do support abortion rights. And then, uh, you know, McCarthy would if if the discharge petition got 218 signatures, he'd have to put it on the floor. He doesn't mm. have a choice. Yeah, I and mean, then it, then it would go to the Senate. So the, and then if if Fetterman, you know, you've got Fetterman, right. Warnock wins, Nevada, Nevada and Arizona go Democratic. You've got 51. So at that point, it's on cinema. Forget Manchin. You don't need him anymore. Cinema has said that she opposes changing the filibuster to do abortion rights because it would allow Republicans perhaps to ban abortion. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that ship has kind of sailed. Mm -hmm. So make, make her take that stand, you know, get it through the house, get 49 Democrats on board and say, Kirsten Cinema, in a, in a primary, you're running a primary against Ruben Gallego. Are you going to be the woman who stands in the way of codifying Roe v. Wade? If, if, and if you are, okay, we, then we did everything we could. We pushed it as far as we can. Now we're going to knock you out in this primary. Oh, yeah. Um, but well, she might say, you know what? Yes, you know, fine. Let's do it. Right. I mean, I, I love this idea because um, for that very reason, because she there might be not one Democratic senator who's going to be feeling the heat more uh, in, mm -hmm. in, with in this next year um, and leading up to 2024 than cinema just because of how the her home state has rejected broadly the Republican party, uh, this, this election cycle more in, and, and independence. You saw how I saw in the wall street journal, they broke for Democrats by double digits this time. Mm -hmm. And, and there already is a lot of institutional pressure on her as well. So that she definitely seems like of those two, the one that you could push more, um, it's just like sh she's so mercurial that it's impossible to to know what the success rate right. is. But at the same time, there's n there's actually literally no downside. There's only political upside right. for the Democrats. Right. And it, it, it forces her to pick a side. And in a Democratic primary, it means that she either votes the right way, gets it done, um, or she loses her primary. Mm. Uh, and then she can try like. The, like I've heard people worry that, well, she'll just switch parties. That that Arizona Republican Party is so crazy. They are happy to see her cause problems for Democrats. They love that. They absolutely do not want her as a Republican senator. Like she's nowhere near far right wing enough for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so then that would leave her trying to run an independent bid and maybe she could do a spoiler campaign. That would screw over Democrats because you can't rule that right. out. Um, but yeah, so that that's any, you know, in that sense, I think I think uh, the Senate should do it anyway. Like I hadn't actually thought about this either. But so let's say they do hold, come with 51 seats. Schumer should do it. Schumer should, you know, reform the filibuster, codify Roe v. Wade. So that the whole country can see. So a, you put cinema on 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 the block there and and force her one way or the other. Let's say, but then let's say that she does it, agree to do it. You codify Roe v. Wade. Now the Senate has passed it. Now you've got five Republicans 
standing in the way of the codification of Roe v. Wade, five House Republicans or, or whatever the number ends up being. Those Republicans will get asked about that everywhere they go. And it, and it will. And so they will either buckle and codify Roe v. Wade or it will be the defining issue for them in their reelection campaigns. I mean, this is what I wanted them to do with the marriage equality bill that passed the House and was being negotiated for weeks and weeks with the bipartisan group of senators in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And Schumer was insistent that he didn't want to bring it to a vote until it failed. And it could have been used as and who knows if this would have made a difference. But the Barnes and Johnson race was not that not that far apart like it was not Mm -hmm. a shellacking by ron johnson and he was visibly uncomfortable when being asked about marriage equality i would have loved if schumer would have made him take that vote and this is i think kind of an extension what you're arguing is an extension of that kind of thinking no that would that would have been that would have been that would been great and so this is like you know electoral politics and gamesmanship that could also lead to the codification of roe v wade So it's not, you're not just playing around here. Right. Like this, if this goes right, it actually leads to abortion rights being written into federal law. Um, At a minimum, it's electorally beneficial, but it, but it could also quite reasonably work. Yeah. I mean, uh, well said, like (laughs) I'm just so used to nothing happening in the Senate that like uh, my go-to immediately is the electoral ramifications, but that, that, that that's the reality of it. Um, yeah, and the the, uh, the counter argument from some uh, Democrats is they don't want to give some senators the opportunity to vote the right way, like some Republican senators. Mm-hmm. But so look who's up. Uh, it class of twenty eighteen Tester. Um, his you know I think it probably helps, probably, or maybe it's a wash for him. Uh, Sherrod Brown. Um, is up uh mansion is up in 2024 he can vote against it um if, so he can show his independence if he wants mm. to um but who are they gonna be like susan collins no either way i mean um, i just remember like this was a much more benefit 26 anyway yeah. right this was a much more beneficial year in terms of who was up for re-election than will be in 24 but um you know uh 23, 23 Senate seats uh, to the Republicans, 10 in the next election cycle. Who are the, do you have the Republicans there? Um, there uh, I'm it? doing it now. I'm, I'm, it. I'm, uh, I'm looking at it now. But um, cinemas, cinemas up uh, in 24, Feinstein. Uh, you have Rick Scott, Mike Braun, Josh Hawley. Uh, Marsha Blackburn, Ted Cruz, Romney's yeah, up looking, again. Yeah. I'm looking at this, this map. Not a single one of these Republicans would vote to codify Roe v. Wade in a cynical way for electoral benefit. All of them would vote against it. Yeah. Um, and none of them are vulnerable anyway. Well, let's uh, let's turn to some of what you also talked about with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in your interview, because... I mean, this is also one of the major stories of the election. Um, A few states where the Democratic Party just completely... I I could go on a whole rant about what the hell the Florida Democratic Party is doing. I mean, you see some of these numbers about how DeSantis uh, just flipped plus eight Biden counties that were majority Hispanic to plus 11 DeSantis counties this time around. And, you know, good thing that we ran the Republican against the Republican and people chose the real thing. Uh, That's always worked out super well for Democrats. But um, besides Florida, the major story of Democratic Party failure uh, on a statewide level in this election is New York. And um, AOC just like kind of reaffirmed her calls for the head of the New York State Democratic Party, Jay Jacobs, to resign. Um, Let's start there because with Democrats likely losing uh, the House by a small margin at this point, you can really trace the origins of that back to New York. Yeah, if if, if the Democrats don't hold on to the House, it will be because of, of New York, uh, the New York machine uh, where Sean Patrick Maloney, the DCCC chair, also happens to, to represent and lost his 
lost his race. Um, you you saw a sweep in Long Island, um, some which some of it was avoidable had they managed to talk Tom Swozy, who's a kind of centrist uh, Long Island but pop you know popular incumbent. He decided to run for governor, which was absurd. Um, that like that was just absolutely not happening. Um, and so they and then they ended up losing losing that seat. They, so they lost. Um, some some of them, in New York District One, they lost by you know forty thousand votes, uh, two by fifty thousand votes. Um, but District Four, which is you know closer to the city, they only lost that by four points. Uh, District Three, which was um, Swozy's, they lost by eight points. So Swozy would have carried it. But then out in Western New York, um, uh, they lost uh, uh, in District Nineteen. They lost just fifty one nineteen, but two you know two points. Um, it, Maloney only lost his by, you know, a point. Uh, and then, you know, and, and then there's two other races, um, New York 22 and New York, oh, New York 22 that they lost by a point. And then, um, New York 20, 21, Stefanik won it pretty easily. Pat Ryan, like, seems like one of the, basically the only one in New right. York won this close race, um, who ran on a real, you know, corporate accountability agenda coupled with strong support uh for abortion rights uh but you know this also goes back to the redistricting like you were like you were talking about the, this was a a redistricting um ordered by cuomo appointed judges written by some right-wing dude in pittsburgh um after the state party decided not to challenge uh this not not to back a referendum in 2021 that would have uh, basically made it impossible for the those cuomo judges to do that yeah, just a complete disaster. You're talking about five, six seats um, in New York alone um, due to their kind of corruption and incompetence. Well, so what was their motivation for not doing that? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty clear on the origins of why we're in the situation with, one, the judges, and two, why it was punted to this point, which was that Cuomo essentially... Uh, as a part of this bargain that he had uh, made a deal with state legislatures that uh, gave them the the capacity to redraw their own districts that would favor them. Then uh, it was punted 10 years down the line um, to an independent commission. And then Republicans sued so that it was went to the state Supreme Court. And those were judges that were appointed by Cuomo as a way to appeal to Republicans. And they were conservative judges and they ended up ruling with Republicans. But like, why in 2021 did Democrats not choose to cut that process off and mm -hmm. and and make lines more favorable for the next year? Like, didn't have the foresight to do it for the next I year. Think it's, a, it's a good question. I think I my read would be that it goes back to them not really caring about elections like elections for these corrupt machines which and new york's not the only one but it's one of the most corrupt and the most sclerotic they're an annoyance to them like they're not into this to win elect to necessarily win elections for some ideological purpose or, or to make make the lives of constituents better uh they're they're in it to gain positions of power to enrich themselves and, and their friends uh, to do to bring misery upon their enemies, you know, both their personal enemies and their business enemies, and to then, you know, have a nice, uh, robust social calendar. Like they, they throw, they throw, they throw good, they throw good parties. Uh, it's it, it's a very clubby kind of atmosphere, and and that's what it is. And then and the elections are an inconvenience that have to be uh, dealt with in in order to justify the entire apparatus that's a main reason why you have such low turnout like they, they that they even started moving um and it, this cost joe helped cost joe crowley his seat if you want to juice turnout you put everybody's election at the same time you know from from senator down to dog catcher what they figured out is that if if we spread these out then people have even less reason to show up to vote so you'd vote for congress on one week and then down the road you'd vote for judicial seats and then you vote over here for ward leader or whatever and because they wanted as few people participating as possible because they wanted to know every single person who was participating 
and so and be able to rely on their votes. That's why AOC was able to knock off Joe Crowley, winning what was it, sixteen thousand votes or something? Mm-hmm. Just yeah, I mean, he, a hilarious he was, number of people. He was turning out in his primaries like less than ten thousand votes before yeah. she was running. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and he turned out less than ten thousand again. I know. She yeah, turned right. out like 12 or something. It was like the 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 funniest, like lowest number of votes that you could imagine in a 700,000 person district. But that was by design mm -hmm. because they don't want people participating, because if people start participating, then they have to deliver for those people. And people will start asking questions, too. Like you remember the IDC, that the Independent Democratic Conference, which was this collection of rogue Democrats who te basically teamed up with Republicans to make sure that Republicans could control the, the Senate so that uh, no, so that the power then flowed up to the leader of the Senate, the leader of the House, and the governor. That way, organized constituencies couldn't really push on the party to do something um, because uh, they would say, well, we'd love to, but the Republicans and buzz. So that, that was able to fly you know, for years, it was only after Trump that woke up a lot of Democratic voters and then they started paying attention. You know, the, the, that huge awakening, five million people marching the day of the Women's March. After they came home from the Women's March, people were like, well, what's going on here in my district? What can I do to make my piece of the world a better place? And they would Google and be like, wait a minute, I have a Democrat who caucuses with Republicans? Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. And so that that election cycle, 2018, they annihilated the IDC. That's the last thing that they wanted. Putin, his his success over in Russia has come from his complete demobilization of the political process. That's what the New York State Democratic Party says. They've just completely demobilized their base, and that and they that that's how they want to keep it. Then along comes a close election. And now all of a sudden you're like trying to crank this rickety rusty machine saying, hey, guys, actually, it matters. Can, can you guys come out and vote, please? And as you saw, like they, not enough, not enough did. And it, it's going to cost them. It looks like it's going to cost Democrats the House and cost them the ability to codify Roe v. Wade. What what is Jay Jacobs's uh, role in this in particular? The the head of the now, he, he's State like Party. a Cuomo. He's a Cuomo flunky. Um, yeah. Who has just been, you know, he's very tight with the charter and real estate developer world and the, you know, the, the, the corporate kind of nexus of, of New York politics has been, uh, you know, at war uh, with the progressive wing of the party, a vo very vocal war, like very clear that he considers the progressive wing of the party to be a bigger enemy than the Republican. Well, all you need to do is look at India Walton's uh, mm -hmm. uh, election and what he did in there, sabotaging her directly. Doing right, so. she won a primary, and then the party switched its support and backed the guy who lost the primary. Yeah, and that was, and so that's why AOC is basically saying that he should resign. I mean, she's been saying right. that for a while, but do you think there's more momentum given the pathetic, uh, I guess? Uh, showing for the Democrats in New York. It's a it's a good question. the The problem is that they're so you know that that the leadership structure that supports Jacobs is all vested in Jacobs sticking around because they're out. Um, if he's out, and do they care that they didn't win the House? Do they care that they're going to cost the country? The, the ability to codify Roe v. Wade. No evidence that they do. It, it just is amazing to me that the tentacles of Cuomo, it, it, it's like they've been chopped off, but they're still squirming around, right? And he, yeah. his influence is, I know that it's not just him, right? Um, but the people that he in, in, implanted throughout the state are still making their voices heard and, and yeah absolutely and, felt. and and some of them in i think deliberately malicious ways as payback but cuomo had a lot of political skill uh, you know whatever you want to say about him just raw political skill and so he can take a sclerotic system that is built for him and he can sometimes deploy it 
skillfully, mm. you know, in, in elections. Uh, doing a Cuomo machine without a Cuomo just doesn't work. Just having the flunkies and lieutenants, like, you know, you, you, would, you could make a very strong argument that, that the Cuomo machine with Cuomo is, is unethical, it's wrong, it's anti-progressive, blah, blah, blah. But it, at least it has some skill to it. Now you have all the bad parts and none of the skill, just flunkies. Yeah. Right. Um, well, before, uh, I know you, you have to go uh, at some point, but uh, I don't want to just end on doom and gloom fully because we do have some positive developments mm -hmm. um, in the House, including the election of Summer Lee, who I was talking to, to Branko Markatich uh, on Twitter about this. And, you know, he was just pointing out how much and, and we've talked about this on the show before, but how much APAC money was poured into her race, not just in the primary. They came in the general last minute to flood the zone with APAC money against her uh, in uh, in Pennsylvania's 12th district. Mm -hmm. Her opponent has the same name as the Democratic representative, Mike Doyle, who is retiring and he was running ads in Pennsylvania, not identifying himself as a Republican. Yeah. So people were voting early and thinking that they were voting for Mike Doyle, the retiring Democrat. And she overcame that. And 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 Bronco was saying, you know, she ca really crawled through barbed wire for her victory. I mean, have we, we and we we both have uh, kind of reported on a lot of these squad races and and I, I, it's hard to even think of another one of these races where more of the deck has been stacked against uh right. that particular well, the other candidate would be nina the other would be nina turner right uh, but successfully for, for that reason is not right. right 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 exactly so just talk about that a bit uh, yeah uh the amount of money spent against her um calling her not a democrat uh very nearly cost her the primary that that APAC then went from calling her not a Democrat to actively supporting the Republican was just the abs absolute cherry on top. Right. Um, and then in, in the district next door, um, and this is something that Akel Lacey, my colleague, wrote about. Uh, so Crystal Crystal Luzio was running in a, a swing district, and Republicans spent three or four million dollars attacking Deluzio lumping her lumping him with summer lee so and and in the same call and saying you know radical summer lee like extremist summer lee is and delusio or like you know birds of a feather and so that doesn't that money doesn't show up in the ledger as being spent against summer lee but that's you know hundreds of thousands of pittsburgh residents constantly seeing summer lee get called a crazy radical extremist, even though the ads are for a different race. So not only does she face the millions in APAC spending in the primary, all the APAC spending in the general, uh, but but she also had to fend off that millions of dollars in Deluzio spending that was also attacking her. Uh, and Deluzio ended up uh, winning somewhat comfortably, 53-47. Connor Lamb's old district, uh, where, you know, Connor Lamb is the, the poster boy in Pennsylvania. I believe this is Connor Lamb's old district, right, Bradley? No, no. It's Connor not Lambs. No. All right, my brain is. I mean, it's just... hard to say exactly what Connor Lambs is because they move around so much. But um, you might be I... right. Maybe somebody could. We said this on primary night, and I, I might like. I, I don't even remember what I said at all yeah, that I, night. I, so. It might not be the exact because oh, they've been redrawn so much, but. Okay. But yeah, he, he won. Uh, yeah, it but, might not be the exact lines. I think it just might be some of Lamb's old territory in Western yeah. PA. Yeah. Either way, um, poster boy for only corporate centrism can win in this kind of district. And at the very least, Deluzio, you know, had success with yeah. his more progressive pro-labor strategy, very similar with, with uh, Summer Lee as well. And the other one to badly undermine that argument is, is Matt Cartwright, who ran in Northeast Pennsylvania, like Scranton, Hazleton, uh, the just stereotypical Trump country. And he's represented that district as a populist, progressive Medicare for all supporter since 2012, um, which is so funny about Biden saying that back where I come from, that's not what they're for. It's like, well, actually, the guy that represents Scranton is for Medicare for all and keeps winning. 
And he faced a very well-funded, sophisticated challenge from this guy, Jim Bognet, a Republican. Um, and he's going to hang on. It looks like he's 51, 49. He's up by like 7,000 votes. Susan Wild, um, who represents the Lehigh Valley, it did mm -hmm. not is not a centrist, like has been like I was skeptical of her. Um, you know, I think you remember Greg Edwards, the Bernie backed candidate in 2018 who challenged her. Right. Uh, she she beat him in the primary. She's been a pretty, pretty strong progressive uh, in in Congress. Um, and there's some money in that I, district because it's like there's been some spillover from kind of suburbs that have I went to college there. So I remember oh, it where'd you go Lafayette. Okay, my dad went to Lafayette. I'm from that's from from is Allentown. Oh, I, I didn't know that. Born in Allentown, yeah. All right, well, yeah. There we go. Got a whole bunch of family that went there. It's a gorgeous school. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> um, so anyway, she held on um, despite being progressive um, in that district in Allentown, um, and it, so and I'm I'm sure buoyed by uh, Shapiro and Fetterman, who you know did not do the Connor Lamb. Neither of whom did the Connor Lamb playbook. Right. Um, all right. Before I let you go, one more fun thing. Lauren Boebert. <laughs> Lauren I mean, Boebert. what are we going to It's I, last I checked, the margin has been less than 100 votes between the two of them. So I'm oh, sure no. we're headed to some recount. But oh, no, I'm looking at it right now. She's up. She's back up. Yeah, she's Damn. up by about 400 votes now. Damn. The prayers no, are working. No, we celebrated too quickly. Uh, I mean, it's not over. They're still counting, but um, I think a lot. they're counting a lot of same day. I mean, election day voting, um, which even in areas that lean blue, the election day voting right. lean red. But yeah, um, 743 to 357, almost a 400 vote lead uh, for Lauren Boebert here. Who might well, where are all these votes coming from? I mean, we, we just stop the count. Uh, it's, yeah, we don't stop know. the count. What's going on here? But stop, stop the, the count, count two hours ago. Um, I yeah, mean, this just feels fraudulent. Feels I just feel it in my bones. I don't yes. know. Um, I know all right. you're starting to see that from people that like people are mad. It's impossible. Yeah, this I mean, the result. I don't have evidence, but it's just impossible. Well, uh, Ryan Grimm, uh, DC Bureau Chief of The Intercept, you can read his interview with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and also his piece on uh, the abortion mandate for Congress. Um, really appreciate you coming on today, Ryan. Thanks so much. My pleasure.